Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon. I'm still one of my writers. Thank you, Matt. Matt wrote today's episode, The Yorkshire Ripper, Mad Jack's Mad Successor. If you're new here, the format of the show, never read this before. We're going to explore it and read it together. Settle in. It's a bit of a long one. How many pages? 31 pages. <laughs> okay. We're going to be here for a while. Ah, I've poured myself a third night. This was like an hour ago. Now it's just a cold half cup of coffee. But let's go. Jack the Ripper, hands down, one of, if not the most famous and well-known killers of all time. He struck fear and terror into the hearts and minds of all of England between August and November of 1888, leaving a confirmed count of five victims in his wake. We've definitely covered Jack the Ripper, right? It'd be weird if we haven't, and I remember learning about it in depth. So I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. This is the sequel. To this day, the number is disputed, with many believing that his body count could be as much as 11. Vicious and demented, his evil truly knew no bounds. And then he was gone. Just like that, Jack the Ripper vanished, never to be heard from again, let alone caught. His legend is as renowned and investigated to this day as it ever was, though it's probably safe to say that his real name has been lost to history many, many years ago. But we've already covered Saucy Jack here on the channel. Saucy Jack sounds a bit too, like, friendly. <laughs> Jack the f***ing river, doesn't it? Saucy Jack. Oh, it's okay. He's just a bit saucy. Yeah, but he cut that woman open and had to look at her insides. Oh, that's just Saucy Jack, isn't it? Can't blame him. <laughs> He's like, yes, you can. Stop calling it. Maybe Saucy meant something different in the past. But to me, it means, like, it was a little bit saucy. A <laughs> little bit naughty. We covered it almost a year ago at the time of writing, and I still consider it an honour and a privilege that you allow me to cover him in one of my first ever scripts, Simon. Oh, I did, did I? <laughs> I feel bad. I actually just rejected someone who's just started writing for this show. Uh, they were like, can I cover this? And I'm like, yo, steady on, mate. <laughs> Let's start with someone who no one's heard of, and then maybe we can move on to that. Actually, the real reason was someone was already writing it, but still I'd have been less like, um, you know, the big ones I like to give to my more established people nowadays, like Matt. I saw a very nice Reddit thread about Matt the other day, and there were people saying how much they've enjoyed him grow as a writer. And I was like, well, I was quite impressed with Matt from day one, but uh, uh, people have enjoyed him grow, which is nice to read. If you've read that, Matt, I imagine you listened to this. There you go. Good job. With that said, let's cover the sequel, shall we? The setting. The county of Yorkshire in northern England in the year 1975. My grandma's from Yorkshire. She didn't sound like she was from Yorkshire because she moved to the south when she was quite young and married a, a southern man and so she always just sounded south but she had like all these yorkshire things like she liked yorkshire tea she was very cheap <laughs> i don't know if that's like there's this stereotype in the uk like in the south uh, that our northern friends are a little bit cheap and my nan was the sort of person who would use a tea bag twice like she'd make tea in a cup and then she'd take the tea bag out put it on the side of the sink in this weird little place and then she'd use it again later and it's like oh nan that's a bit gross and also she was far from poor <laughs> she lived in this big old house but would still be reusing her tea bags and i'm like nan what's going on <laughs> I just want to take a moment in today's video to tell you about our fantastic sponsor, Holzkern. In a world full of hustle and bustle, it's important to find moments of tranquility, to connect with nature and celebrate what makes you unique. Did you know that Holzkern is celebrating their seventh birthday this year? And over the years, Holzkern's team have grown, paying great attention to detail and becoming the leading brand for wooden watches and natural jewelry in Europe. And now they ship their personal pieces of nature from beautiful Vienna to cool corners of the globe. With over a million happy customers and 10 Holzkern stores in Austria and Germany, they've built a strong bond with their community. So what sets Holzkern apart? Well, they've stayed true to their motto, naturally unique, uniquely natural. Even after creating over 800 different designs, their watches and jewellery are still made with natural materials like wood, stone, and mother of pearl. I've got a wooden one right here, and you can see it all throughout the strap here is just unique pieces of wood, which is lovely. Each piece is naturally unique just like you, but it doesn't stop there. Holes can believe in giving back to nature too. They prioritize sustainable production, packaging, and delivery routes. Plus, they partner with organizations like the Jane Goodall Institute to support reforestation and other environmental and social projects. And so whether you want to celebrate your own uniqueness, spend more time in nature, or simply treat yourself to something special, Holzkern has got you covered. Make sure to check out the link in the description below to explore Holzkern's incredible collection, and don't forget to use the discount code CASUAL15 to get that 15% off. And now back to today. 
today's video. 87 years after the spree of Mad Jack came to an end, another ghoul was set loose on the streets of England. Within a span of five years, he claimed the lives of 13 women in the dead of night, with an additional nine left injured at his hands. Many leads were brought forth, almost all of them nonsense and dead ends, leaving the police scratching their heads as the bodies continued to drop like flies. Sound familiar? It seems that almost a hundred years after Jack's streak of horror, people are just as eager to get in on the fun when it comes to serial killers. <laughs> oh my lord, let's get in on the fun! What do you want to do this weekend? I'm thinking about becoming, you know, Jack the Ripper too. Oh my! So everyone, as the shadows engulf us once again, let us sit as I regale you with the story of a man so insane, so bloodthirsty, that he truly can be called the successor of Jack the Ripper, a man so vile and depraved that his impact is still felt on the streets of Yorkshire to this very day. There have been many who have been given the name Ripper throughout human history, but few have earned the moniker quite like this monster of a man. This is the tale of the Yorkshire Ripper. The Devil's Playgrounds As we did when we spoke of Whitechapel one year ago, it's where Jack the Ripper was hanging out. Old saucy Jack. I believe it's best to set the scene for the horror to come. West Yorkshire, a large and bustling county in the Yorkshire and Humber region of England, from all I've heard and seen, it's quite a beautiful place, with vast cities such as Leeds, Bradford, Wakefield and Huddersfield, to smaller towns and parishes like Halifax, Saddleworth, Keeley and Walsden. I don't think I've ever been. Maybe I've been to Leeds. Oh, I went to Leeds recently! I went to Leeds very recently. I was just there for one night before I took a boat from somewhere near Leeds to the Isle of Man. It was lovely. It was, I mean, it was very windy and kind of cold for like the middle of August when I was there. But it was, it was, I stayed in a really nice hotel. Hotel was great. That's it. It was nice. <laughs> With theatres, restaurants, shops, and galleries aplenty, there's much to do in West Yorkshire. And of course, the grand landscapes and countryside, from what I've seen, are quite breathtaking. Brought to you by Visit Yorkshire. And of course, there's the lively nightlife. <laughs> Just continues. With pubs and clubs galore, there's no shortage of places for folks to go out and cut loose. After a long day's work, you can get a drink, go dance, meet up with friends, or even go mate a new lad or a lady for a romantic night on the town. Okay, Matt, sell it to me. Sell it. What should I be doing in the north, Matt? Now, before Simon goes off on me again about the potential kickbacks I may have been getting from West Yorkshire yet, I'm describing West Yorkshire, more or less, as it is today. Back in the 1970s, it was a very different story. While still a nice place to live, West Yorkshire was in the middle of a societal lull during that time. During World War II, it was an economic hub, a place with plenty of jobs and a lot of work to go around in correspondence with the war effort. After the war, though, well, jobs started to dry up, especially as everything that was originally made there was soon overtaken by foreign imports. Add in the mass amount of immigrants from other countries, as well as from other parts parts of the UK, and there just weren't a lot of jobs to go around. Money started to become harder to make for some people, especially women, and so sadly many of them became sex workers in order to make ends meet. Sound fairly familiar? They might as well have taken West Yorkshire and replaced it with Whitechapel in 1888. Women were selling themselves on the street for money to provide for themselves and their families. Neighborhoods were becoming downtrodden and run down, and even though there were folks who could make a good living, the opportunities to do so were few and far between for those who didn't already have it. And so why do I include this section? It's like quite a good, like, I don't know much about like Yorkshire in the 1970s. Was my nan living in Yorkshire in the 90s? No shot. She'd have moved south way long ago. She was like born in the 1920s, right? So 1920s. Then she went to she went to university in Sheffield. She became she was a doctor. Like she went studied medical school back in the day. I imagine she was like one of only like two women in the class or whatever. Back when women could have become done. The good old days. <laughs> no, she'd have moved south way before then. Because my mum was born in 55. So she, and she was born in the South. Oh yeah, should have moved South way, way soon after that. Well, this section is here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to drive home a singular fact. The people of West Yorkshire at the time, while hard up, still felt safe. They felt it was only right that they could walk the streets at night and not have to worry about making it home. They felt safe, which only made what happened between 1975 and 1980 that much more shocking. The aura of safety, the idea that a young woman could go out on a whim and have a good time, was all shattered when women started dying in brutal ways. Just imagine that. The terror they must have felt, the feeling that they couldn't even go out their front door after sunset because the darkness had an agent out there, knife in hand, waiting for them. West Yorkshire might be a wonderful place to live now, but for those five years, for a relatively short period of time, the devil came to town, and West Yorkshire turned into a place filled with fear 
unease, and trepidation. Attacks in the Dark It all started on July 5, 1975, in the market town of Keeley, in the city of Bradford, borough of West Yorkshire. That night, 36-year-old Anna Rogulski had been out with her boyfriend, Jeff Hughes, for a night of fun. Everyone who knew them believed that the two were close to tying the knot, but that night, they had a fight, so Anna decided to call it a night and left at Jeff to go drinking with friends. It was around one in the morning when she was dropped off at her home. Jeff still wasn't home, and she was pretty miffed, so she decided to take a walk to his house and tell him off. She arrived at his home, and after getting no answer, she eventually threw a shoe at the window, breaking it. Defeated, she retrieved her shoe and was in the middle of putting it back on when pain exploded in the back of her head. Before she could register that she wasn't alone, she had been struck unconscious by a blow to the head. She fell to the ground, and her attacker wasted no time, using a hammer to bash in her head twice more. After lifting her skirt and removing her underwear, he took a knife from his pocket and started slashing at her stomach. Luck was smiling at Anna that night, though, because before he could kill her, a neighbor noticed what was happening and called out. Wow, I assumed that this... I mean, I sort of, like... Because this is being told from a somewhat... No, not a first-person perspective, but we know Anna's experiences... You're thinking, okay, well, she survives. But then he's like, bashed her twice in the head and then started stabbing her. It's like, oh my god. Pulled from his frenzied attack, the monster called back to the neighbor, telling him to go back inside. Unable to get any details on the attacker's face and not understanding what was happening, the neighbor did. Her attacker realized that there was a chance he could be caught, though, and he decided not to take any more chances that night. He fixed down his clothes and left her bleeding on the ground before he vanished back into the shadows. Anna was rushed to the hospital where her stomach was treated, and after undergoing brain surgery, she made a full recovery. Excellent. Sadly, she was left traumatized by the attack, and who can blame her? Yeah, Jesus Christ. That is like, that is, you know, I don't know. Like, nothing like that has ever happened to me. Like, some major, major, I mean, there's been, like, traumatic things in my life, but nothing like this. And you're like, oh my God, can you, like, you dream about that? It's like, though, it's like, I don't know, like, crimes, especially against, like, women and stuff. And it's like, that shit must haunt you for like ages. Like I just think about all the tiny things that happen to me and how like some minor things like still bother me and like still like you know you think about it and you're like why am I thinking about that? And then just for something so traumatic to happen and then to have to live with that forever is like I, it's I don't want to sound like insane, but I, it's going to sound insane and completely insensitive. But I'm trying to just illustrate a point of how damaging something like this can be because i still have dreams or like nightmares where i haven't prepared for an exam that i'm taking and i think like okay i guess that must have been quite a stressful time in my life like doing university exams or whatever and i still have these dreams where it's like i just haven't prepared for them and it's like for some reason i'm doing my job that i do now i've got no need to take exams but it's like oh my god i haven't prepared for this exam and that is like the most minor trauma that everyone goes through. And you can't possibly compare it to something else. Can you imagine something like this happening to you? Or like a sexual assault or something? And then I just can't imagine how much that would weigh on your mind for so long afterwards. If something as minor as exams is something that I still have nightmares about. That sounds insane. Like, I don't mean to compare the two. I just want to use one as a base for how minor something could be compared to something so major and how that can haunt someone. You're left standing by yourself in the middle of the night outside your boyfriend's home and attempting to give him a piece of your mind when out of nowhere you're viciously attacked and nearly killed. It's enough to rattle just about anyone. <laughs> anyone who's not rattled by that is a psycho. It's like, uh, you have any lingering effects? No, no, I'm fine. It's like, do you have any emotions? Nah, <laughs> no emotions. That's why I'm fine. Hey! <laughs> She was terrified of strangers for years to come, broke up with her boyfriend, and boarded herself up in her house with her five cats, her life sealed behind a barricade of locks and alarms. When asked about it, Anna had this to say, I've been afraid to go out much because I feel people are staring and pointing at me. The whole thing is making my life a misery. I sometimes wish I had died in the attack. And then, a little over a month later, it'd strike again. It was August the 15th, 1975, when the next victim was attacked. This was 41-year-old Olive Smelt, this time in the town of Halifax, the borough of Calderdale in West Yorkshire. 
On that night, she had gone out of town for some drinks with a couple of girlfriends, and her husband, Harry, had stayed at home to watch over the two kids. At around 11.45 that night, Olive was dropped off by some friends a short way from her home. Ducking down an alley as a shortcut, she was nearly home when all of a sudden she heard a voice behind her. Yeah, this is like whenever I'm at home with the kids and my wife goes out to meet her friends. Like, I live, we live in the middle of a very safe city, but I'm still like, if she's out, like, I'm not going to bed. I'm just like, just going to stay up until she gets home because I'm like, I'm like, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine. But just in case, just going to wait up, just going to wait up, just to be sure. And then I'm like, can you text me when you're coming home? <laughs> when I'm going out, she's also worried about me. And I'm like, I'm not, you know, look, I'm not the one that someone's going to attack in like the street. And if they are, is they're just going to mug me and take my shit. Like, whereas it's different if you're a woman. Weather's letting us down, isn't it? Before Olive could so much as turn around, her world went dark as a hammer slammed into the back of her head. She fell forward to the ground, getting hit once again as her assailant jumped on top of her. Wasting no time, he once again switched from his hammer to his knife, pulling up her clothes before slicing up her lower back right above her rear end. And just like the first time, before he could go any further, he was interrupted. The lights of a passing car illuminated the alley, causing him to flee. Barely conscious and terribly injured, Olive dragged herself from the alley, leaving a trail of blood behind her. Neighbors would hear her weak moans and calls for help, and they quickly brought her inside. An ambulance was called, and she was taken to the hospital, where after brain surgery, she was able to make a full physical recovery. I say physically, because like Anna, Olive was understandably mentally scarred. The attack left her with terrible memory loss, along with severe depression and trust issues. She stayed inside more often than not, and when she did go out, every single man who passed her on the street caused a jolt of fear within her. She even looked sideways at her own husband, fearing that he could have been the one. And speaking of her husband and her family, they suffered as well. Olive took no interest in anything going on in the home, took no pleasure in cooking or doing housework like she once did, and her drive for sex was gone. On more than one occasion, Olive would simply express the wish that she had been killed that night instead and insisted that her life had been ruined. So I know what you must be thinking. Well, Matt, what of the police? Surely they must have been on the case, especially after the second attack, right? Now, normally I'd say yes, but sadly, we had already run into an old friend of this channel, good old-fashioned police incompetence. Both Anna and Olive were questioned about the attacks, Olive even giving the critical detail that the man who attacked her had a Yorkshire accent. Well, they are in Yorkshire. Neither Anna nor Olive was attacked or even found in the red light district of town, and yet the fact that they were dressed for a night out and their clothes were disheveled afterwards seemed to speak more to the police than anything. Oh my god, police. Are you just like, well, <laughs> there's two layers here. One, even if, and they aren't, even if they were sex workers, that doesn't mean you can't take the, sp the case seriously, police. What the f***? And two, they weren't. How about you make less assumptions and do more actual policing? They were dressed like sex workers and they were treated as such. As the attacks on Anna and Olive were dismissed, the investigation went nowhere because of it and the police simply went about their day. Another cup of tea, governor? Be like, oh, that'd be lovely. How about you do some police work? The next attack wasn't any better, as this time the monster targeted a child. This was 14-year-old Tracy Brown, and it was on August the 27th, 1975, in the town of Silsden. He didn't sneak up on her. He didn't appear out of the shadows. No, this time he spoke with her, spent a bit of time with her, and she didn't feel uneasy, as he did, even though he was certainly an older man. In her words, quote, We had walked together for almost a mile, about 30 minutes. And I never once felt intimidated or in danger. I'm going to tell my 14-year-old daughter, if you're walking along and an older man comes and talks to you for half an hour, leave. You're 14. And she'll be like, oh, dad, I'm a big girl. I'll be like, just, just do this for dad. Just please. Come on. <laughs> That's probably why she didn't see any of it coming. Without warning, the nice, charming stranger that she'd spent a nice nighttime walking with suddenly pulled out a hammer and struck her five times in the back of the head. Tracy was knocked out, but before the villain of our story could do anything, oncoming headlights once again scared him away. Tracy was saved, though she would also need brain surgery to fix the damage. You know what the f part about all of this was? When she was 16, Tracy saw sketches of a man who she recognized as the man who attacked her. His reign of terror had already commenced in full, and so she went to the police. And what did they do? Absolutely nothing. They dismissed her, thought she was a stupid girl, telling stories, pulling a prank, and so they did nothing of it. Can you imagine the frustration, the rage that she must have felt to be totally disregarded when she only barely survived a run-in with the madman that they'd been after? Fucking police, man. 
get it together. I really hope this is one of those episodes where it's like, and then along comes Detective John or whatever, and he's the legend of the story, and he whips the police into shape, and he's just a hero. I really hope so, rather than just continuing police incompetence, because I find that really frustrating. Well, regardless, after three near misses, the gates of hell opened up in West Yorkshire, and shortly after, the Ripper would claim his first life. Death returns to England. The first body was found on October 30th, 1975, lying face upwards on a sloping grass embankment of the Prince Philip playing fields off Scott Hall Road in northeast Leeds, West Yorkshire. Her skull had been cracked twice, and she had been stabbed a total of 15 times, once in the neck, twice below the right breast, thrice below the left breast, and nine times in the stomach. The police were out in full force, and it wasn't long before they had a name. The body was identified as 28-year-old Scottish woman Wilhelmina, or Wilma, Mary McCann, a mother of four. She was a fiery woman who was never able to find her feet financially. Having been divorced from her abusive and drunk husband, according to her own son, there were even times when she would go to social services and threaten to leave all her children unless she was given money. It was around 7.30 the previous night when Wilma was last seen by her children. She told them she would be home later that night and to be good until she got back. Being one to enjoy the nightlife, even when short on money, Wilma went out drinking until around 10.30pm and she was last seen, drunk and incoherent, at around 1am after jumping in front of a car on the road, trying to get the driver to take her home. Oh, Wilma, you've had too much to drink. Her body was found the next day, only 150 feet from her home. The sad thing about it? At around 5 in the morning, her two oldest children, 6-year-old Sonia and 5-year-old Richard McCann, were found huddled together, cold and confused at a nearby bus stop. Their mother hadn't come home yet, so they wanted to go out and see if they could find her. Recalling the next morning, Richard recounted on the Netflix docuseries The Ripper, quote, All I can remember is being out in the street, kind of liking being in the street, because we could see this bit of commotion. Mum's not here. We'll be all right. Won't get caught. And then being back in the house and the police asking us questions. I remember people giving us cups of cocoa and it felt nice. This was really unusual, coming from where we'd come from, and all these people were making a fuss over us. It was lovely. We didn't know what was going on. And eventually I remember the officer sitting us down and just telling us that our mum had been taken to heaven and we weren't going to see her again. To say things were off to a bad start would be putting it mildly. This was twofold. But the first reason was that the town itself wasn't too keen on the police, let alone helping them. I mean, sure. People like, you know, they're like, ah, oh, coppers always giving me tickets, pursuing me for minor crimes, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Like, ah, oh, you know, you know, you know, just like in some places that could be like in the UK, I feel like it's interesting because, you know, I'm from the UK. I live in Czech Republic. The relationship with the police is very different in the UK. Like they're the sort of people you go up to them and you'd ask them for directions. And look, this is my experience as a middle class white dude, obviously. You know, they're the sort of people you'd go up to and ask for directions. Being like, oh, you know where this is? And they'd be like, of course, it's just down there. You know, just go like this. Or it's like, oh, could you help me with this? And they'd be like, of course. Whereas the relationship, like my experience, at least here, not that I have any direct, but like talking to friends and stuff, is like there's a more adversarial relationship with the police. They're not the sort of people you'd be like, morning, you know where the pub is? They'd be, they're just, you know, doing their policing job of catching crime or whatever. But the point I was kind of trying to make with this is like, yo, but when someone is out murdering, doesn't everyone band together and it's like, well, look, I don't like the police giving me a parking ticket, but I sure am going to help them catch a murderer because that seems important. Like they put aside that like adversary, adversarial, adversarial ship. <laughs> what is the word for an adversarial relationship? Oh, God, Simon, you're so dumb sometimes. You know what I mean, though. A large number of minorities and immigrants have been treated so badly by the local bobbies that they wanted nothing to do with them, and the same goes for all the sex workers in the area. Yeah, and that's why I specified, like, my experience with the police as a white middle-aged dude. Uh, middle-class dude. Now middle-aged. When do you become middle-aged? I'm 36. I've got to be almost there, right? I'm looking forward to it. I've got my nice little middle-aged life. <laughs> And that brings me to the second cock-up, one that would stick with the entire investigation until the end, and was just the start of the police department sticking their heads right up their own bottoms. Because of how she looked and was dressed, how she had acted before, and where the police found her, which was very close to the red light district of Chapeltown, the police instantly labelled Wilma McCann as a sex worker, which she wasn't. Bro, police, do you think like everyone is like, oh yeah, women are attacked, they're dressed, uh, they're dressed up a little bit, you know, they're going out on the town? Must be sex workers. Police, get your shit together. It's embarrassing. 
She was down on her luck, but enjoyed the nightlife. She liked to consort with people in the taverns and pubs around the area. Because of this, it made sense the local cops to label her a sex worker, a label that seems to carry on to this day, when all she was was a mother who was having a rough go of things and just wanted to get away from it all. She wanted to escape, away from all her worries and woes, and sadly, she ended up killed for it. If this was a man, there would be no question. They're like, oh, is he a sex worker? No, no, no! That's just John! He likes to play the field. It's like, like, yo, police, I know this is the 1970s, but come on, <laughs> come on now. Now, because of the police's mindset when it came to Wilmer's murder, almost nothing was initially done to solve her case. To the cops, it was just another sex worker who'd been killed, another dead whore after a bad night. A prime example of the lesser dead mindset that seems to persist even to this day. Same with the press, as Wilmer's murder was barely mentioned in the newspapers. Society simply seemed all too willing to brush her murder under the rug and move on with their lives. That is, until the next body was found. Emily Monica Jackson was 42 years old, and the body was discovered on the 21st of January 1976, just after 8 a.m. the following morning, only 800 yards from the Gaiety Pub on Round Hay Road. She was married to a man named Sidney, and they had four children together. Sadly, the family had fallen on a hard time, so Emily had taken to selling herself on the street for cash with her husband's help. Oh my god, that's gotta be miserable. The two of them would drive about Leeds in their blue comma van, and after parking, Emily would go looking for John's and Sydney would wait for her at a local pub until she was finished. Sadly, he was left waiting that night. On the evening of January the 20th, Emily was making her rounds outside the Gaiety when she was approached by a man in a car. He asked her if she'd be willing to provide certain services, and Emily agreed. Her John drove her about half a mile to some derelict building on Enfield Terrace in the Manor Industrial Estate. She never stood a chance. After exiting the vehicle, the killer wasted no time, taking up his hammer and bashing her twice in the head, fracturing her skull. After she had fallen, he dragged her into a dirty, trash-filled alleyway and took out what was later identified as a sharpened Phillips head screwdriver and proceeded to violently stab her in the neck, chest, and abdomen a total of 56 times. During the attack, the killer ended up taking off her bra and exposing her breasts, almost as if to humiliate her further. Then when he was done, as if to simply show off his unyielding disgust towards the now dead woman, he stamped down full force on her thigh, hard enough to leave a boot mark, before taking off into the night. Her legs were also placed open and facing toward the road, so that anyone who came around the corner would see her sprawled out in the alley. It was as if the killer had taken her there as a way to take out the trash. It didn't take long for the police to draw a connection between the two murders. First off, the wounds and methods on both Emily and Wilma were identical, besides the difference in murder weapon. Yeah, I mean, Jesus Christ, these are incredibly brutal murders. If the police are like, oh, I don't think they're connected, it's like, how many murders are going on in Yorkshire like this? Surely there's not that many extremely violent murders. Secondly, Emily was a confirmed sex worker, and she was found in a similar area to Wilma right outside of the red light district of Chapeltown. Also, the Gaiety pub was known for being a popular nighttime hangout spot for men, particularly because of the constant striptease show that they had on a nightly basis. Because of this, the idea that the killer hated sex workers and only sex workers became the prevalent theory from that point forward. This was challenged and even disproven a number of times, but we'll discuss them soon enough. Just know that the idea of the murderer having a vendetta against only sex workers never left the minds of investigators and would at times influence their decision-making. This is something we talked about a lot on the show. The police getting railroaded, like they come across a theory, an idea that they like, and then they mold the facts, they mold their discoveries to that theory. Not even intentionally, just like they see it in the way they want to see it and it's important to like get off the rail railroad to stop being railroaded and look at the wider picture the carnage continues the next attack though thankfully not the next fatality didn't take place until may the 9th 1976. this was 20 year old marcella claxton she was simply enjoying a night out at a party with her friends in chapel town once the party was finished, however, she started making her way home at around four in the morning. Now remind me, Simon, I believe one of the main suggestions we have is that women shouldn't accept rides from random strangers in the middle of the night, correct? Uh, I don't know if it's one of the rules, but it absolutely should be. Don't accept rides from random strangers in the middle of the night. Anybody, not just women, men as well. Unless you're like mega tough. And even if you are mega tough, someone could surprise you. Don't accept random rides from people. Well, unfortunately, that's just what happened. As she was walking the streets alone in the middle of the night, which you also shouldn't do... Mm, yeah, I often walk the streets alone in the middle of the night, though. You can't avoid it sometimes. What are you supposed to do? Not walk to different locations? Like, it's just how it is. If you're a woman, I'd highly recommend that you carry some pepper spray. And not in your bag. Keep it in your hands. Or uh, a taser. 
or stuff like this. Yeah, my wife, like before we had kids and we used to go out more, like, and she'd go to, I can't remember what it was. She had some club, like some, I don't know, dancing or something like that. And she'd come home and she'd go through this like slightly dodgy park from the the tram station where it was to our to our flat. And she'd be like, yeah, I don't like the dodgy park. <laughs> and she had this like terrifying dazer as this fuck off thing. And it'd be like, <laughs> you'd be like, oh my God, like you just point that at someone and it's this giant flashing thing with this huge like arc of electricity. I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, I just walk through with that in my hands. <laughs> Anyone comes near, just like zap their shit out of them i'm like okay oh it was karate it wasn't dancing it was karate as well so that's like i don't know my wife's a bit scary i guess <laughs> which is good which is good well unfortunately that's just what happens as she was walking the streets alone in the middle of the night which you also shouldn't do a white car with red upholstery pulled up offering her a ride home which she drunkenly accepted i have to say i do like that aesthetic the white car with the red inside like the blood red on the white I feel that looks really cool. I feel that's the sort of thing that it's like, if you buy a car like that, it's going to destroy its resale value because people are like, oh, dude, really? (laughs) I quite like it. (laughs) On the ride there, Marcella asked the driver to pull over. She had to take a leak, and so the driver agreed, pulling over to the side of the road so that she could handle her business. Unbeknownst to her, the man wasn't driving her home, but instead driving her to a remote area of Soldier's Field just off of Round Hay Road. Marcella got out and went behind a tree to urinate, but before she could finish, she felt a sharp pain in her skull as the hammer made contact with the back of her head. She fell, and was hit again, looking up at the man who was grinning down at her. According to Marcella, the monster was playing with himself the whole time, then cleaned himself of her blood with some napkins he had in the car and drove off, perhaps believing he had killed her, but he hadn't. Crawling away from the site, Marcella managed to regain her footing, regardless of the massive hammer-sized hole in her head. Getting to a telephone, she called for an ambulance. Her wound required 56 stitches to close and a week's stay in the hospital. But just like the others who survived, her mind wasn't the same after that. For years, she hated men. And for years, she lived with the after-effects of the attack, including spells of depression and dizziness. The saddest part of all? Marcella was four months pregnant at the time, and because of the attack, she lost the baby. Unfortunately, and much like the other survivors, it wasn't until later that her attack would be linked to the spree of murders. Good lord, police. Get it together. This is embarrassing. As the months rolled on and the police kept their investigation going, the public was getting more and more anxious. Sex workers started moving together in groups as a way to keep safe. The murders were the talk of the town, with everyone in every pub and tavern speculating about the identity of the monster prowling their streets. Hell, there are even those who believed that the streetwalkers deserved what they got simply because they were outselling themselves for money. <laughs> Jesus. The next lost life came on February the 5th, 1977, when the body of a young woman was discovered in Round Hay Park. This was 26-year-old, 28-year-old, sorry, Irene Richardson, a Chapel Town sex worker, and she'd last been seen alive the night before at 11.15 p.m., leaving a rooming house on Cowper Street. She was found by a dog walker that morning, lying face down, her feet towards the road, her boots neatly placed on the back of her legs. Her handbag was found by her body, and its contents were neatly arranged next to it. The police did notice one detail, though, arguably their first real clue. Tire tracks were discovered next to Irene's body, and it would later be determined that they belonged to either a medium-sized sedan or a van. Photos of the tracks were taken, as was a plaster cast, but sadly, nothing came of it. Irene was a mother of two young children at the time, but because of her lifestyle and the way of living, they had been put into foster care. That night, she said she was headed to Tiffany's Club, a pub and disco in the centre of Leeds. Whether it was before Irene had gotten to the club or after she'd spent time there is unknown, but either way, she ran into the evil that had been darkening the streets of West Yorkshire, and it claimed her life. He attacked her, as he always did, with three swift strikes to the head with a hammer, and when that was done, he stabbed her three times in the stomach, killing her. Sound familiar? In fact, people also started to pick up on the similarities between the Devil of West Yorkshire and Jack the Ripper. The newspapers at the time picked up on it too, looking for a name that would capture the attention of the populace and the world. And it was a no-brainer. Jack the Ripper might have been long gone, but the Yorkshire Ripper had just been born. Taking home a monster. The police 
were puzzled. They had absolutely no idea as to who this madman could be. And it didn't help that the investigation was disorganized from the word go. No one knew who was in charge from one day to the next, with deputy head of the force Dennis Hoban being the initial head of the investigation, only to be replaced by Detective Chief Superintendent Jim Hobson after a period of time. It also didn't help that the police force, between the similar boroughs in the area, had been amalgamated into a larger overall police force with many officers shifting around from different departments. Because of this, valuable knowledge that they had of their local areas and the people in them was lost in the shuffle, only making the investigation into what was their first real serial killer case that much harder. And two months later, the Ripper would strike again. This time it was 32-year-old Patricia Tina Atkinson Mitra. She was killed late at night on April the 23rd, 1977. She was another sex worker, but there was one major difference with the similar-sounding murder. It had taken place in her home. Indeed, at the time of the attack, Tina was living alone in a flat in Bradford following her divorce. Based on the footage I've seen of the area surrounding the flat, it's fair to say that the place was the pits, with junk and rubbish everywhere as far as the eye could see. Tina was known around the area as a sex worker and was known to drink rather heavily at the local pubs. That night, she was seen at around 11pm heading in the direction of her home and into the clutches of the beast. On her way there, she came across a man who offered to give her a ride home. Intoxicated and thinking this could be an easy mark for the night, she agreed being led to his car. He drove her there, and before she could even say a word about payment, he struck her in the back of the head a total of four times. With that, he took her to bed, ripped open her black leather jacket and blue shirt, pulled up her bra to reveal her breasts, and pulled her jeans down to her ankles. He then proceeded to stab her six times in the stomach, ending her life, before pulling her jeans back up and fleeing the flat, leaving another boot print behind. While not as brutal and gory, the fact that this took place in Tina's lodgings gives me small flashbacks of Mary Jane Kelly, the last victim of the Canonical Five, who had been attacked and torn apart in the home in the dead of the night. And the Canonical Five are the generally accepted victims of Jack the Ripper. I know they're up to 11, but there are five who is just widely accepted as definitely being his victims. The similarities in this string of murders just keep stacking up, don't they? In describing the feelings surrounding this particular killing, newspaper journalist Krista Aykroyd, who lived close by at the time, said the following The Ripper docuseries, quote, I knew that this was an area of really run-down, derelict bedsits, and Patricia's vulnerability did really strike a chord with me. Suddenly, it started to move closer to me personally. This was not late at night, in a playing field. This was somebody who went into a block of flats, into somebody's room. She must have looked at him in the eye, and believed she was safe, and invited somebody in to kill her in the privacy of her own surroundings. Now, all these killings were totally random, nothing to link the victims together or to a specific suspect. All they had going for them was the idea that the monster they were hunting was only targeting sex workers, no more, no less. And they were dead certain of it. Now, we know today this was wrong, that at this point, one of the victims and nearly all of the survivors, who the police had no idea existed at the time, that I might add, were not sex workers. But the police clung to the idea. They knew that it had to be true. Police were railroaded, as I said. The press also repeatedly put that out to the public, the term sex worker being used more and more to describe the victims and further perpetuating the idea that if you weren't one of these street-walking women and were considered by society as a morally upstanding citizen then you were going to be fine. That is, until the next victim was killed. The one that would shatter their theory almost entirely, and the one that would put the world on notice. When everything changed. Jane Michelle MacDonald was born in Leeds in 1960, the second child of Wilfred and Irene MacDonald. In 1977, she was 16 years old, and she had left Allerton High School and had been working as a shop assistant in the shoe department at Granway Supermarket. She was a normal girl, an everyday girl, an innocent. Now remember that word. It will be very important in a bit, but from all reports, Jane was a good girl, someone with a bright future ahead of her. Definitely not the type one would worry about being targeted by the Ripper. And then June the 25th of 1977 came around. That night, Jane kissed her father goodbye as she left her home in Reginald Terrace, Chapel Town, and went out to meet friends at a local German tavern named Hofbrauhaus. A night of drinking and dancing with loved ones sounds like a great night out, especially for a girl without a care in the world. Eventually, it got to be late, and the final bus home had already departed, so at 11.50pm, she went back to her friend's house to wait for her older sister to come and pick her up. She waited there for about 45 minutes. After her sister failed to show, she began the long walk home. Her body was discovered at 9.45 a.m. the next day. She'd been found by a group of young children in a playground between Reginald Terrace and Reginald Street in Chapeltown. She was lying face down on the ground, 
Her shirt had been pulled up to expose her breasts. Her skirt was a mess. She had been struck three times in the head with a hammer, and she had been stabbed several times in the chest as well as once in the back. It was this killing that turned the investigation as well as public perception on its head. From the start, the belief that the Ripper was only targeting sex workers was set in stone. Whether this had any footing in fact, or if it was just the prejudice and effects of misogyny against women at the time, it just seemed to make things easier. Jane's death shattered that almost entirely, and it woke up all of England to the real danger. The papers at the time made a point to use the word innocent to describe Jane. That she was this delicate child, a respectable girl, brutally slaughtered by the monster that was haunting their streets. Sex workers in the public eye weren't innocent, but this girl was, and now she was dead. This had gone from a small article to front-page news in an instant. And now the pressure was on to solve this case. The police tried desperately to hang on to the sex worker theory, saying the Ripper must have mistaken the child for a streetwalker, that it was a chance killing, nothing more. But the people weren't having any of that, and the respectable ladies of West Yorkshire were officially scared now that their veil of protection was finally torn away. In the words of journalist Henry Matthews on the state of things, quote, Prior to that point, the fear, if you like, had been exclusively felt by working-class sex workers, but from Jane MacDonald on, there was this feeling that no woman was safe, end quote. Jane's father, Wilfred, never recovered from the shock and grief of her death. He simply lost his will to live, and two years later, in 1979, he passed away from a broken heart. Her murder also led to mass outrage from women in the area, leading to the formation of the Reclaim the Night movement, blaming the police for being slow and incompetent in catching the killer and failing to protect the ladies of West Yorkshire. The police were now under the microscope with the public both crying for answers and calling in with any information that they could come up with. People who were previously reluctant to talk to the police and were happy to just watch how things played out were now calling in with any info that they thought could help, now that they felt personally threatened, of course. And with this newly found revitalization in the case, a change at the top was seen as necessary in order to get the job done. All of this would have happened much earlier, police, if you had, you know, done your job and investigated murders. Just because the people were sex workers doesn't mean you get to be lazy, police. Although apparently, in this case, it does. This introduces us to one George Oldfield, a well-renowned officer of the law who at the time was famous for helping to solve the case of the M62 bombing. He was promoted to the station of assistant chief constable because of it, and after Jane's death, he was assigned to take over the Yorkshire Ripper case. Did I predict this? Is this where our legendary copper enters the picture and he's going to shake things up and get this sh done? I really hope so. Let you be that legend, Mr. Oldfield. Let's go. Many within the force were skeptical of the change, especially when most believed that Jim Hobson was doing a good job with the case. Many thought that Oldfield's particular experiences didn't fit well with the case, as he hadn't dealt with as many murder cases as they had. Regardless of how they felt, though, the police were no closer to catching the monster than they were before. And they were getting desperate. So much so that they actually took a space out in the Yorkshire Evening Post in order to send a letter to the Ripper. It was titled, A Message to the Ripper, and it read as followed, quote, You've killed five times now. In less than two years, you have butchered five women in Leeds and Bradford. Your motive, it is believed, is a dreadful hatred of sex work, is a hate that drives you to slash and bludgeon your victims. But inevitably, that twisted passion went terribly wrong on Sunday. An innocent, 16-year-old lass, a happy, respectable, working-class girl from a decent Leeds family crossed your path. How did you feel yesterday when you learned that your bloodstained crusade against streetwalkers had gone so horribly wrong, that your vengeful knife had found so innocent a target? Sick in mind that you undoubtedly are, there must have been some spark of remorse as you rid yourself of Jane's bloodstains. What? I mean, it's obviously horrible that this 16-year-old has been killed, but also this is so dismissive of all the other victims who, you know, maybe they're f***ing people too. Like, come on. It's unknown if the Ripper actually saw the message, but if he did, I can simply imagine him reading it, letting out a laugh, and continuing on with his day. He wasn't deterred, as the police would find out over two weeks later. Only this time, things would be a little different. The police would get a breakthrough. And her name was Maureen Long. The first survivors, a new location, and fresh evidence. Now. We've already spoken about how there were a number of survivors of the Ripper up to this point. However, the police either were totally unaware of their existence or simply brushed them off as uninvolved. This time, though, they had to pay attention, and this time they had what they believed was the first real survivor of the killer. Maureen Long was her name, and she had also come away with her life after a brush with the madman loose on the streets. It was Saturday, the 9th of July, 1977. She all got out for the night, visiting pubs and having a good time around Bradford. 
After meeting up with her ex-husband for a round and agreeing to meet up later for the night, Maureen found herself at Tiffany's, dancing the night away at a popular discotheque. She had finished up around 2 a.m. that night, and it was while she was waiting for a taxi to take her to her ex-husband's abode that a white corsair drove up to her. The man inside offered her a lift, saying he'd take her wherever she needed to go. Don't get in the car. Don't get in the car. I know you survived, but still, it's going to be bad for you. Don't get in the car. Being intoxicated and wanting to get where she needed to be, Maureen agreed and got inside. Drink will do many things, including dulling the senses enough to get into a stranger's car while a monster is out on the prowl. Yet, yeah, don't drink that much. Don't get so drunk that you are able to do that. It's a really bad idea. She was driven to bowling back lane, and that's when he struck her, a massive blow to the head that sent her reeling to the ground, and he pounced on her, stabbing her in the back and the abdomen. He didn't finish the job, though, since a dog started barking nearby and scared him off. He left her there to die, and his car was spotted leaving the area at around 3.27am. Maureen didn't die, though. She was found by two women later that morning after they heard her cries for help, and she was rushed to hospital where she underwent extensive surgery to repair the damage to her head and body. Oldfield and the rest of the police were overjoyed. Finally, they had someone who could tell them about the killer, someone who had seen him and lived to tell the tale. They wanted to talk to her before she even went into surgery. They wanted the information as fresh as they could get it, but thankfully, sense prevailed and she was allowed to be treated. She stayed in the hospital for nine weeks before she was released. When she was finally questioned, one thing became clear, though. The damage Maureen had sustained to her head severely impaired her memory of the night before. While she could vaguely remember leaving Tiffany's, what happened after that was murky at best, non-existent at worst. Even when she was taken back to Tiffany's by an officer by the name of Andy Lapp to see if the man who had attacked her was there, she was unable to help them. And what had made it worse was the fact that the witness who had seen the car had actually misidentified the type of the car to the police, so around 300 cops were dispatched to check countless cars that led to absolutely nothing. Then the next victim was found on October the 9th, 1977. This was 20-year-old sex worker Jean Bernadette Jordan, who had gone missing back on October the 1st. However, one of the striking things about this victim was her location. All the other victims had been found in the same general area, that of course being West Yorkshire. Jean, however, was found in Manchester, where she had been living with her boyfriend, Alan Royal, along with their two sons. More specifically, she was found in Princess Road near Southern Cemetery, which was basically a wasteland. The man who found her was Ian Royston Jones, perhaps better known by his stage name of Bruce Jones, an actor on British television. He's probably best known for his role as taxi driver Les Battersby in Coronation Street. Back then, he owned a plot of land in that area, and it was while he and friends were working on said plot of land that he found the body. When taking part in the Ripper docuseries, Bruce recounted his finding of Jean's body, choking up multiple times as he did so to quote, It was a lovely sunny day. I'd got a day off work, he'd got a day off work, so we thought we'd go down the allotment and get a shed up. I was getting all the old bricks to lay a base, and I i only realized later on that I'd rolled my wheelbarrow over this girl. Her hair was burnt off, her face was smashed in, her breasts were cut off. She was disemboweled. She, she was cut in the most horrendous ways a person could cut someone. I'd run to the phone box across the road, rung 999. They were there within minutes. End quote. She was last seen near her home in the red light district, near Moss Side, and getting into a white car before being driven off. Wanting to make some money, she had gotten into the car with this man, perhaps thinking this was just another night on the job. All that dreadful business up in West Yorkshire was their problem. There wasn't a need to be worried about something like that down in Manchester. Except there was. After they arrived at the cemetery, she was viciously attacked and killed, her head bashed in, her body mutilated. However, the killer had unwittingly left the tiniest bit of evidence behind. A single five pound note hidden in the secret compartment of jean's handbag it was theorized and later confirmed that the ripper had given jean the note before they arrived at the ceremony then after he had already left he remembered it and returned later to the scene unable to find it the beast flew into a rage and took it out on jean's body hence the extensive damage examining the note the police were able to trace it back to branches of the midlands bank in shipley and bingley with this evidence, the police conducted interviews with over 5,000 men from a number of businesses in the area who did business with the bank, with the hope that perhaps one of these workers would be the scoundrel that they were searching for. That is a big net to cast, though. Just like a random £5 note. And they're like, well, let's just see where this £5 note was in circulation. I mean, it's, it's 5,000 people. Sadly, nothing came of it, and the police were left frustrated after another dead end, even after the killer himself was interviewed. Oh, okay. Okay, Matt, you just revealed a little thing there. Like, all through this episode so far, I've been like, do they actually catch this guy? Do we know who it is? Because, like, Jack the Ripper was never caught. 
Is it like this? Because I haven't been given a name so far. I haven't been given any indication that he was caught. And Matt has just revealed to me that maybe the police ultimately catch this guy and know who he is, which would be nice. Did they have death penalty in 1970s? I don't think so. Which honestly is a bit of a shame, isn't it? I think we last executed people in the UK by hanging. That'd been good. I think that would be good. He deserves that. Well, that's right. They were on the right track. They had eyes on him. He most definitely was there, but he slipped away. All because he had a good alibi that was vague enough time-wise to get the police off his back. Said alibi? A family party attended by his loved ones who could all corroborate he was there. They almost had him. He was in their grasp. And he evaded them once again. However, that wasn't the only bit of evidence the police would gain. And sadly, it would come at the expense of another girl. It was the night of December the 14th, 1977, when he would attack again. The victim, 25-year-old sex worker Marilyn Moore. That night, she left a friend's house in Galthorn Terrace near the Gaiety Pub at 8pm. She was on her way home when she noticed a car following her. Thinking he was a man looking to hire out her services, she let it follow her to Franklin Place, where she went up and spoke with him. Introducing himself as Dave, he asked if she was working. Marilyn said yes. He gave her a price, and she got in the car. Driving to a vacant lot in Scott Hall Street, he suggested they have sex in the back of the car. As she was getting out, he hit her in the back of the head with a hammer. Quote, I didn't feel the first one. I felt the second and third blow. As I felt the third one, my hands were on top of my head. Then I, I remember grabbing his trousers, and as I grabbed his trousers, he pulled away, and I heard him go back in the car, and as he drove off, his back wheels skidded on the back. He had left Marilyn there for dead, but thankfully she survived, was found, and an ambulance was called. She was treated at the Leeds General Infirmary and made a full recovery, though she suffered from depression for a long time afterwards and to this day has scars on her head from the attack, including an actual hole in her skull. The police knew instantly that she was a ripper victim as soon as they spoke with her and investigated the scene. Not only did this attack match all of the others, but tire tracks were also found at the scene that matched those previously found on the scene of Irene's murder. There was one major difference about this attack, though. Not only did the victim survive, but she remembered his face. Speaking to her, she was very specific about the details. A man of about 30, stocky build, around 5 foot 6 tall, with dark, wavy hair and a beard. A photo fit was created from the description, one that Marilyn verified, and was hung in every police station for all to see. They might not have a name, they might not have known who he was, but finally, the Yorkshire Ripper had a face. Ripper 8, Police Nil. The police oh, were a bit more confident now that they had a face to search for, but that didn't stop the bodies from piling up. On February the 3rd, 1978, a new body was found, that of 18-year-old sex worker Alina Helen Ritka. At the time of her death, she had been living with her twin sister Rita in a room next to a motorway flyover in Huddersfield. Both had been put into foster care, both had worked as sex workers to own money, but they both aspired to be more in the future. They wanted to get out of that life. Sadly, at least one of them was not going to get the chance. It was January the 31st when Helen's life was snuffed out. It had been a snowy night, and she and Rita were making the rounds in the red light district looking for work when a car pulled up. The chance for money was too good to pass up, so she got into the car with the bearded man being driven to Gerard's timber yard. As she got out of the car, she was struck five times in the head. As she fell, he moved her body so as not to be noticed by people nearby and removed most of her clothes before proceeding to stab her in the chest, piercing her heart and lungs. The police were distraught. They had all the confidence in the world thanks to the fresh evidence, and yet another girl was killed. It was as if they were truly chasing a phantom in the night, a shadow in the dark, and the Ripper had to feel almost invincible at this point. And of course, it didn't help that no one was talking to them. The women of the night had no lost love for the police, so even with a monster on the loose, they simply didn't trust them, and of course, their clients didn't want to come forth and be outed either. It got to the point where the police started offering a reward, one that got all the way up to £30,000 which is going to be a hell of a lot more money today. And that only seemed to make things harder. The idea was that it would encourage people to come forth. And they did. Just with nonsense. People would call in simply for a chance to get the money, or to get even with the men in their lives that had wronged them. Unfaithful husbands, ex-boyfriends, you name it. And many scorned women rang up the police to claim they knew who the Ripper was. It was all utter crap. But then the first letter came. On March the 8th, 1978, a letter was delivered to the police addressed to George Oldfield, and it reads as follows, quote, Dear Sir, I am sorry I cannot give my name for obvious reasons. I am the Ripper. I have been dubbed a maniac by the press, but not by you. You call me clever, and I am. You and your mates haven't a clue that photo in the paper gave me fits, and that bit about killing myself, no chance. 
I've got things to do. My purpose is to rid the streets of them sluts. My one regret is that young Lassie McDonald did not know cause changed routine that night. Up to number eight. Now, you say seven. But remember Preston 75? Get about, you know. You were right. I travel a bit. You probably look for me in Sunderland. Don't bother. I am not daft. Just posted letter there on one of my trips. Not a bad place compared with Chapeltown and Mangingham and other places. Warn whores to keep off the streets. Because I feel it coming on again. Sorry about young lassie. Yours respectfully, Jack the Ripper. Might write again later. I not sure last one really deserved it. Whores getting younger each time. Old slut next time, I hope. Huddersfield never again. Too small, close call, last one. This guy doesn't sound... His English is terrible. So... He's like, I'm clever. It's like, <laughs> are you though? Now, I need to ask you, Simon, as well as our dear audience, did any part of that letter sound familiar? If the answer is yes, that's because it should. While not word for word, the structure and the way of speaking are almost identical to that of the Ripper letters from Jack almost a hundred years prior. Okay, maybe it's just old English. Maybe it's just he's phrasing it like Jack the Ripper, which is super weird, but maybe he is cleverer than I give him credit for. It seemed that the successor was truly trying to live up to his name. If this was the Ripper, that is. Why do I say that? Well, because it wasn't. The letter and others that came after were all fake, regardless of how authentic they seem to be. One of the main red flags comes with the number of victims. Seven have been confirmed, and when he talks about an eighth, the writer refers to the death of one Joan Harrison, a murder that at the time was suspected to be the work of the Ripper, but wasn't so. However, this blunder actually had a double meaning. There was an eighth body. The police just hadn't found her yet. This is 21-year-old Bradford sex worker Yvonne Ann Pearson, and she was found on March 26, 1978, near Lum Lane, a wasteland of filth and garbage. A passerby had noticed an arm sticking out from underneath a dirty old sofa. After examining the body, it was found that she had been bludgeoned with a hammer exactly like the others, and her mouth was stuffed with horsehair from the very couch that she was buried under. There was a newspaper placed under her body. So, what's the problem, Matt? I hear you asking, how does this mess up with the continuity of the letter so badly that you say it's clearly a fake? Well, simple. Yvonne Pearson had already been dead for two months before the letter was opened and before her body had even been found. It was January the 21st, 1978, when Yvonne, in the hopes of making some money, left her two children in the care of a babysitter. Sadly, they'd never see their mother again. That night, after leaving the Flying Dutchman pub, she was picked up on the street by a familiar white car. He took her to the wasteland bashed her head in until she died, turned over the sofa onto her, and then for good measure, he leaped onto her chest, crushing her ribs. And the paper we just mentioned? It was dated a month after the murder, suggesting the murderer had returned to the scene. It was as if he just wanted to taunt the coppers, as if he was saying, hey, she's been rotting here a month, and you haven't found her yet? I'm Jack. After that, another piece of fraudulent evidence was sent to the police, but not before two more women met their ends. This guy's really outstripping Jack the Ripper, isn't he? Five confirmed victims, eleven maybe. So what's this guy on? Nine? No, eight. Coming on for nine. And now ten. The first was a return to Manchester, a visit that cost the life of 41-year-old sex worker Vera Evelyn Millwood. A mother of seven, she was living with her boyfriend at the time in a flat on Greenham Avenue, Holm, and had been feeling under the weather after the last three of her recent operations. On May the 16th, 1978, she had stepped out to get some cigarettes and painkillers, and while out, she was propositioned for sex, which she accepted. This would be her final mistake. The Ripper drove her to the grounds of Manchester Royal Infirmary, where he proceeded to attack her. He struck her in the head three times with a hammer, then proceeded to stab and slash her multiple times in the stomach and in the back, essentially disemboweling her. He then dragged her to an easier-to-see area out in the open where she could possibly be found. He then left for her to be discovered the next morning. It was as if he wanted to give him credit for his work, like he enjoyed the fame and the recognition. I think he clearly does. I definitely think so. Like he's modeling himself after Jack the Ripper and he wants people to know he's just like Jack the Ripper. His hero, for whatever reason, is f***ing psycho, but I think that's exactly what's going on. Of course he wants them found. He put the newspaper with the date under the old body being like, yo, police, come on. Come on, look at me. Look at me. Look how horrible I am. Come on. After her death, George Oldfield was at his wit's end, almost as if admitting defeat, or at least that's what it feels like, he appeared on television and asked the Ripper to simply come forward and surrender to the police to, quote, In your own interests, it is now time for you to come forward and give yourself up. I'm anxious that we catch you before you've time to add another death to the appalling catalogue that you've already got to your credit. 
Good on you, George. I'm sure that'll convince him. But of course it didn't, because he'd kill again 11 months later. And once more, this killing spat in the face of every assumption that the police had about the killer. This was the murder of 19-year-old clerk Josephine Ann Whittaker, a normal girl from a middle-class family. She had been walking home from work on Savile Park Moor in Halifax, West Yorkshire, when she had been attacked in the dead of night. She hadn't even seen him coming, as he appeared behind her and struck her with a ball-peen hammer. She fell to the ground and was hit again, her skull being fractured from ear to ear. The Ripper then grabbed a screwdriver and proceeded to stab her 21 times in the chest and stomach and six times in the right leg before driving it fully into her vagina. He had destroyed her and almost totally dismantled the police case in the process. He moved out of the red light district and had targeted a young girl who clearly wasn't a sex worker in the middle of a well-to-do neighborhood. The police couldn't spin this one in any way, and combined with the murder of Jane MacDonald, it was clear that the police had been wrong from the start. No woman was safe, and he wasn't going to stop. Really, it took you this long, police? If you hadn't been so blind and railroaded from the start, you'd have realized this a long time ago. And then the tape came. Addressed to George Oldfield, a cassette tape had arrived on the 17th of June, 1979, from the same individual who'd been sending the letters to him over the last few months. Um, okay, so we know it's fake then, right? Played for the Ripper for Task Force, it goes as follows. And they must, don't they know it's fake by now? Haven't they discovered that other body under the sofa? Or have they not yet? It goes like this. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no luck catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George, but Lord, you are no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. I reckon your boys are letting you down, George. They can't be much good, can they? I'm not quite sure when I will strike again, but it will definitely be sometime this year. I'm not sure where, maybe Manchester. I like it there. There's plenty of them knocking about. They never learn, do they, George? At the rate I'm going, I should be in the book of records. I think it's 11 up to now, isn't it? Well, it's been nice chatting to you, George. Yours, Jack the Ripper. Now, normally something like this would be a remarkable piece of evidence for the police. Hell, it would mean that they actually had the criminal's voice on tape, except, well, no. The tape, much like the letters, was anything but real. The individual was getting his kicks by sending these faux correspondences to the police, getting his jollies by sending them running in circles. And the worst part was, the police fell for it. Experts told them it was a hoax. Hell, the FBI themselves told them the tape was a fake, but they didn't listen. They clung to the tape, clung to the idea that this was real, that this was a real lead, when they truly had none. And because of that, the investigation went right into the toilet. Do you remember that the second victim, Olive Smelt, had told the police that her attacker had a distinctive Yorkshire accent? The man on the tape, who would eventually become known as Wearside Jack, had a distinctive Geordie accent. And so the police began ruling out any and all individuals they had interviewed, or in their sights, who didn't have a Geordie accent and outright ignored anyone, including survivors, who told them that the killer had a Yorkshire accent. Hell, they started playing the tape all over the country, letting people hear what they believed was the voice of the Yorkshire Ripper. Oh no, police. His activities in 1979 ended on September the 1st of that year, the cost of another life. This was 20-year-old Bradford University student Barbara Janney Babs Leach. She had been out at the Manville Arms pub with friends the night before and had even called home earlier in the day to ask her mother to wish her father a happy birthday, telling her that she would return home that Monday to spend a week with them both. Sadly, as we now know, she never got the chance to see her family a final time, as along with her and her friends, the Ripper was in attendance. He had set eyes on her that night and waited for her to leave. That came at 12.45, after the pub had closed. She and her friends had stayed back later in order to help clean up and drink with the owner. Babs had asked her friend Paul Smith if he would join her on a late-night walk, but he declined, allowing her to walk into the night alone. But that was her undoing. As she walked past an alley on Black Ash Grove, the Phantom of Yorkshire leapt from the darkness, bashing in her skull with a single swift blow. She was dead before she hit the ground, and then he dragged her into an alley, tore at her clothing, exposing her breasts and abdomen and underpants, stabbed her eight times, and dumped her near a number of trash cans to be discovered the next morning. I think her father, David Leach, summed it up very well, describing the unfathomable heartbreak the death of his little girl had caused their family to quote, When Barbara died, my wife bought herself a new outfit to wear to the funeral, and it was rather expensive, and I raised my eyebrows at the price. But as she said then, it's not just for Barbara's funeral that I shall be wearing that. This is for her graduation, and her wedding, and the birth of their babies. That's what's been taken from us. Our future. She was not a sex worker. She was a student. Once more, flying in the face of all the police had believed, the authorities were out in force using their new evidence to try and wrangle their killer. Many people were interviewed, including the killer himself, but of course he was let go. Why? Simple. 
He had a Yorkshire accent, and the police, desperate to believe that the tape was real, eliminated anyone without a Geordie accent. The Final Year of Bloodshed For the last four years, the Ripper had been tearing through West Yorkshire, and thankfully, we've reached the final year of his reign of terror. Unfortunately, it didn't come without the shedding of innocent blood. The night of August 20, 1980, almost a year after the last death, was marked by the murder of 47-year-old civil servant Margaret Walls. Living in Farsley, she worked at the Department of Education and Science, and, and that night she left between 9.30 and 10.30 p.m. to make her way back home. Sadly, she wouldn't make it back. Out of the darkness came the hammer smashing into the back of her head. After she fell, the Ripper kneeled on her, continuing to strike at her head as she screamed, all while calling her a filthy whore, which of course she wasn't. In order to hide her from view, he tied a rope around her neck and dragged her twenty yards into a high-walled green before continuing to choke her until she died. Then he stripped her of almost all her clothing before covering her in grass and leaving her to be discovered later. After she was discovered the next morning, only 400 yards from her home, the police ruled her out as a Ripper victim because of the fact that she had been strangled, something he had never done before. I've been on the arse of the police all this script, but for this I give them a pass, since it was an understandable mistake. Yeah, that's fine. There's plenty of other police incompetence in this video, isn't there? It's not all incompetence. Two months later, he attacked again. 21-year-old Maureen Mo Lee was an art student at Leeds University, and she wanted to be her own woman, strong and independent. The night was October the 25th, 1980, and Mo had gone out with her friends to a pub in Chapel Town, a fun night of drinking and dancing. As the night progressed, Mo started on her way home and cut through a dark street in order to catch the last bus home. She was attacked as a result. The assault was vicious, but she managed to survive. She was unconscious when she arrived at the hospital, and when she awoke, she found herself with a puncture hole to the back of her skull, a fractured skull, a fractured cheekbone, a broken jaw, a severed spinal cord, and numerous scratches and bruises. When recounting the attack and her stay in the hospital for the docuseries The Ripper, Mo had this to say. A couple of doctors explained that the injuries were similar to those of other Ripper victims. I wasn't going to hear that. And I didn't tell anybody that said that. To be associated with a killer of sex workers, it's just too dark. You know, too dark and too sinister. The best thing to do was to, to just get on. Get on and finish the degree. The police came. They asked me to relay the events of the evening, and so I explained in detail what I'd done and where I'd walked, and off they went. And I didn't hear from the police at all. Nothing. Nothing at all. I think they played it right down because they could not face the public ridicule and anger that was surfacing at the time. Dr. Upadhyaya Bandara was next. 34 years old and from Singapore, she was visiting Leeds at the time as part of a World Health Organization scholarship. It was September 24, 1980, and she had been visiting a friend in Headingley, Leeds. As darkness fell, Upadhyaya began her long walk home, walking past a KFC. Sorry, Simon, but it seems I'm about to ruin KFC for you today. As she did, though, she noticed she was being watched from inside the restaurant. Meeting the eyes of the man, she took note of his black hair, his full beard, and moustache. Sound familiar? Upadhyaya kept on walking, determined to get home, eventually making her way into Chapel Lane, an alley that cut through to Cardigan Road. As she did, though... She was hurled to the ground and struck in the head with a hammer. With her rendered unconscious, the Ripper tied a rope around her neck and began strangling her, dragging her along the street. He was startled, though, by oncoming footsteps, so he retreated into the night. Thankfully, Apudia survived. But the police didn't believe her that it was the Yorkshire Ripper, regardless of the description that she gave that matched the sketch to a T. Why wouldn't you believe her, police? That's insane. <laughs> Why? <laughs> His next target was one of his youngest. This was 16-year-old Teresa Sykes, and it was on the 5th of November, 1980, in Huddersfield. At the time, she lived with her boyfriends and their three-month-old son, and that night she had gone out to spend time with her father at a pub called The Minstrel. Afterwards, Teresa had started on her way home and was making her way through a small grassland, just a short walk away from her home, when the monster struck. Smashing his hammer against her skull, she fell to the ground, and he kept on striking her. Teresa wasn't knocked out, though, and as the blows kept coming over and over, she let out screams of fear and pain. Her boyfriend, Jimmy Fari, heard the cries and rushed to the window of their apartment. Seeing his love on the ground at the mercy of a demon, he panicked and he rushed down to help her. Seeing Jimmy rushing over, the Ripper simply turned on his heels and disappeared into the night. Teresa thankfully survived, receiving successful brain surgery and spending weeks recovering. Sadly, though, the Ripper had left his mark. Teresa was a changed woman, going from a happy-go-lucky girl to a woman who would flare up at ang in anger at the drop of her hat. She hated and was scared of men to the point that she was scared of Jimmy, the boy who loved her dearly, to the point where she moved out of their apartment. 
and back in with the parents just brings it back to like that why i said earlier like this is damage that people carry forever the final victim and the final life stolen was that of 21 year old jacqueline hill a student at leeds university on the 17th of november 1980. she had dreams of joining the probation service when she graduated the following summer but she'd never get the chance as she got off from the number one bus at the stop opposite the arndale shopping arcade she passed by the kfc where the killer once again finished his dinner i'll never be able to look at fried chicken the same way again i'm ignoring it i love kfc <laughs> just because someone who's a psych- plenty of psychos love kfc i'm sure just statistically but i like kfc <laughs> i'm not a psycho i'm gonna continue loving kfc he started following her just as she had passed by and was on her way home in fact she almost made it her mother had been worried about her living alone because of all the attacks from the ripper so jacqueline recently moved to the all girls flats in lupton court which was part of a complex of university residents behind the arndale shopping center she was only a hundred yards from her home from safety when it all came crashing down the hammer struck her in the head and it faded to black dragging her to some vacant land just behind the arndale shop's car park and shielded from view thanks to the trees and bushes the ripper got to work removing her clothes before stabbing jacqueline's unconscious body over and over again in the chest before stabbing her once through the eye he left her there to be discovered the next day when a worker found her body at 10 10 a.m 13 women dead nine savagely injured and the police were left chasing their damn tails the yorkshire ripper had been utterly unchallenged for five whole years and the whole time the police were too stubborn to start expanding their search clinging desperately to the sex worker theory even when it was disproven multiple times and to the idea that he was a geordie even when everyone and their grandmother was telling them the tape was a fake they couldn't let it go and it cost so many women their lives and the most disgusting part was that the killer had been interviewed a total of nine i repeat nine times and they let him go every single time hell on november the 25th 1980 a man named trevor birdsall who was actually a friend of the ripper reported him to the police fingering him as a suspect and what did the police do they interviewed him and they let him go but now thankfully we've reached the end of our murderous timeline and that's because after that the reign of the yorkshire ripper finally came to an end and all because of some remarkable dumb luck red-handed the public of yorkshire especially women were in a panic and more than anything they were angry the police were useless and the only thing they could think of was to put a curfew in place for women and if any woman was out at night it was advised that they'd be in the company of men at all times this pissed off the women something fierce as they had been fighting for equality and fair treatment for years and all of this always seemed to be pushing them back into the fight a number of marches took place throughout west yorkshire manchester london york and other areas all women all calling for their right to walk alone safely at night the prevailing chant being men off the streets um okay yeah i get it but the problem is that the the guy's a murderer if they're wanting men off the street he's just going to prowl around somehow like in a car and he's still going to get away with it if if i was a woman hard to say because i'm not a woman but i'll be like yeah i'm gonna go out but i'm just gonna make sure that i'm with men that i trust like i'm not gonna go out alone at night because i don't want to get murdered and i'm sorry but the reality is that this psycho is targeting women he's not targeting men so i don't know like yeah normally all for this more power to you ladies but when a homicidal lunatic is on the loose hunting down and butchering women in the streets at night i'd say precautions are warranted yeah fair enough i think i'm exactly the same position as matt there i'm like well obviously (laughs) women should have the same rights as men (laughs) we're all humans but how about we don't get murdered then came january the 2nd 1981. that night sergeant robert ring and constable robert hydes were driving along melbourne road broomhill sheffield south yorkshire it was just a normal night for them even with the panic of the ripper still palpable on the streets that's when they noticed something a brown rover 3500 parked on the street with the motor running inside they could see a man and a woman and they had a pretty good idea of what they were doing pulling up behind them the both of them got out and asked the couple to get out of the car and identify themselves the man said his name was peter williams and the girl claimed that she was his girlfriend ring didn't buy it though he knew exactly who she was this was olivia reavers a 24 year old and known sex worker in the area in fact she'd been arrested for street walking and currently had a suspended sentence it was at this point that the man asked if he could step away in order to relieve himself which he was granted he shuffled off into the darkness returning several minutes later telling the two of them not to move ring and hyde decided to run the plates for the rover and they didn't match curiouser and curiouser 
Confronting the man about it, he said that he had lied because he didn't want his wife to find out that he was with a sex worker. Neither officer was having any of that, though, and they took the men in for questioning. It was quickly found that jurisdiction over the man fell to the police in West Yorkshire, so it was quickly transferred to the Dewsbury Police Station to get the process underway. As the questioning began, and the man was locked in a cell, several things became clear. First was that his features were a dead ringer for the photo fit about the Yorkshire Ripper. He also lived in the general area, being from Garden Lane, Heaton, Bradford. His blood type was B, the same type believed to belong to the Ripper, and the lack of a Geordie accent was thankfully not taken into account. Oh, thank God. <laughs> if it was, so they're just like, oh, well, you don't sound like a Geordie, so out you go. I'd lose my f- mind and then looking back at the records it was made clear that once he got his actual name that he had been questioned nine times and can you sense those puzzle pieces beginning to fall into place however there was one final nail to put in the coffin here and that would once again come from sergeant robert ring hearing back from dewsbury that the man was still in custody and he was being looked at as potentially being the yorkshire ripper ring made a decision of his own volition ring drove back to the site where they'd arrested the man and started looking Ah, he took the hammer into the woods when he had a pee. And he or when he said he was gonna pee and threw it in the woods, right? They're gonna find that. And then that's gonna be great news. Good for you, Ring. No team, no dogs. He simply went in alone and scoured the area for any sort of clue. You are a good policeman and I like you. Then coming up on the area where the man had gone to relieve himself, he finally hit the jackpot. Hidden away in some foliage was a hammer, some rope, and a knife. He called into Dewsbury, informed them of what he had found, and the man was formally charged as the Yorkshire Ripper. At long f***ing last. Let's go! And that man's name was Peter Sutcliffe. Oh, I've heard of Peter Sutcliffe. I know, Pete. This, this name is... Yeah, okay. The Peter Sutcliffe was the Yorkshire Ripper. It's all falling into place in my mind as well now. Introducing the Ripper. Now... Ladies and gentlemen, let's finally meet the villain of our tale today. Peter William Sutcliffe was born on June the 2nd, 1946, in Bingley, West Riding of Yorkshire, to the parents John William Sutcliffe and Kathleen Francis Coonan. Something of note was that Sutcliffe was born premature, having to spend the first few weeks of his life in hospital. While that is something most of us can feel empathy for, it starts making sense when you realize that John Sutcliffe was an abusive piece of shit who abused Kathleen to no end, causing her untold amount of stress, which no doubt resulted in the early labor. Do I even need to say rule number two at this point? Don't f*** up your kids. So this guy was f***ing up his kids before they were even born. That's some record shit, John. You douchebag. So how exactly did John treat the rest of his family? Well, how about when old John smashed a beer glass over Sutcliffe's head for once sitting in his chair at the Christmas table when he was five years old? Oh yes, he was also a violent alcoholic, par for the course. He would verbally bully his children and even went so far as to whip them with his belt. I mean, this was the 70s, though, wasn't it? <laughs> I don't want to make excuses for this piece of shit, but it was a different time. And it didn't help that Sutcliffe was a small kid, perhaps due to being born premature. Because of that, not only did his dad pick on him, especially for his hatred of sports, but the kids at school did as well. It seemed that no matter which way he turned, there was always misery waiting for him. His mother, Kathleen, did her best to show him some love, though, which unfortunately raised the ire of his father as well. John despised his wife and hated how his son clung to her apron, calling him a wimp, a pansy, and a mama's boy, which the local boys did to call him as well. Sutcliffe loved his mother more than anything. He saw her as nothing short of perfect, until his father crushed that too. In 1970, John dragged Sutcliffe and two of his siblings out of bed and to a local hotel. You see, he'd been suspicious of his wife for some time, believing she'd been cheating on him. Of course, that's not a laugh, him being distrustful of her, despite being a cheating womanizer. Was he right? Well, yes, but our point still stands. He posed as her lover instead of her husband, and when she arrived, he berated her and taunted her with a set of negligee from her purse, all in front of their children. That is mega f***ed up. What are you doing? This seemed to have a negative effect on Sutcliffe, really shattering the angelic image that had created in his mind of his mother. She had been a cheater, she had been sneaking around with another man beside his father, and it sadly got the ball rolling for the horror to come. Women were things not to be trusted, things to be overpowered and browbeaten, something to be used and thrown away when you're done. Dr. Kerry Nixon, a forensic psychologist familiar with the case, believed the incident affected Sutcliffe greatly. Quote, the incident in the hotel is absolutely the most significant figure of what goes on to happen. Even the perfect women have become distorted. Women will let you down. Women will lie. Women will treat and are not to be respected. End quote. John even remembered the instant reaction Sutcliffe had to the shock of it all. Quote, I remember Peter were just standing there. He was shook rigid. 
He had a look on his face, like an animal it were. I think it may have turned his mind. By the age of 15, Sutcliffe had left school and was going around working menial and low-paying jobs, including two stints as a grave digger in Bingley Cemetery in the 1960s. He also seemed to have an odd fascination with the dead at this point, seemingly enjoying the digging of graves a bit too much and even volunteering to do overtime to wash the corpses. Uh-oh, get him on a list! If you're like, if you volunteer to wash corpses, not paid, overtime, you need to be on a list of weirdos. <laughs> not a criminal list, just a little list that they go to first when they're investigating criminal most people on the list let's hope that nothing ever you know there's nothing ever bad about them but there should be a list <laughs> even if it's a secret list that the police don't have to tell the public about maybe it exists oh, i hope it exists and they just don't tell us about it that'd be great just uh you know keeping an eye on the weirdos list keep it on the down low if someone asks freedom of information redact that by this time, Sutcliffe had also become a bit of a peeping Tom, walking the streets and getting his jollies off by watching prostitutes and their johns interacting and doing the deed. So, I'm sure you must be all thinking, this guy had no social life, he was an utter creep, and a clearly no sense of how to treat women. And I mostly agree with that, but he also got married. Yeah, these people, they can pretend they have the masks. They can put on a mask and just pretend to be normal and respectful and all this shit while inside they're just like... <laughs> you know psychos on february the 24th 1967 peter sutcliffe met 16 year old sonia zerma she was a local nightclub in the red light district of bradford and somehow they hit it off they dated for a number of years and in the end they were wed on august the 10th 1974 i was just trying to work out his age he was 24 it's a bit weird so now you must all be thinking how did being married not mellow him out at all he had a wife and he still went out and did all of this well, it didn't help that his wife was very quickly contributing to all of the problems in his head. By all accounts, Sonia was a very harsh and domineering woman, one who was prone to fits of rage and violence against her husband. She'd talk down to him, make him feel worthless, and was described by journalist Barbara Jones as, quote, the most irritating, strangest, and coldest person I've ever met. She's so incredibly prickly and demanding. On top of all that, not only did she have several miscarriages and was informed that she was incapable of having children, but she also had an affair with a local ice cream truck driver. Between her... <laughs> It's not stereotypical, it's like, uh, it's the postman. <laughs> Between her income as a teacher and his own, the couple were able to buy a house at Six Garden Lane in Heaton, which they moved into on September the 26th, 1977. By that time, Sutcliffe had already found a job as an HGV, that's a heavy goods vehicle driver for TWH Clark Holdings Limited on the Canal Road Industrial Estate in Bradford. It was thanks to his job driving around that he was able to move about nearly undetected, going to and from the towns and cities of West Yorkshire where he wished. However, he had already been treading a dark path, stretching back to 1969. That year, Sutcliffe committed his first serious crime, the assault of a local sex worker. He'd been driving around with a friend, searching for a woman who had tricked him out of his money previously. Leaving the minivan and vanishing into the shadows, he came back soon after, claiming to have found her. He had tracked her down to a garage and hit her in the head with a stone and a sock. According to Sutcliffe himself, quote, I got out of the car, I went across the road, and hit her. The force of the impact tore the toe off the sock, and whatever it was in came out. I went back to the car and got in it. The police were informed that as the woman didn't want to press charges, he was let off with just a warning. If he was telling the truth about his motives is not known, but that was the end of it. For six years at least. Whatever caused him to fully snap after that is also unknown, but whatever it was led to a full-blown path of death and destruction that is still talked about to this day. For five years, he was free on the streets, killing and assaulting at will, literally laughing at the police all the while. He was questioned nine times to no avail. He was even taken in for drunk driving in 1980. He was awaiting his trial for that when he committed his final year of bloodshed, as if he didn't care that he was already in trouble with the law. Thirteen dead women, and nine more whose lives were changed forever. And the rest, as they say, is history. The Confessions Quote, I had the urge to kill any woman. The urge inside me to kill girls was now practically uncontrollable. These are the words of Peter Sutcliffe himself, telling the world how he felt compelled to kill. He didn't even make it through two days of questioning before he gave up everything. It was on January the 4th, 1981, when, after he was informed of the discovery of the hammer, knife, and rope, that Sutcliffe confessed to being the Yorkshire Ripper, and over the next couple of days, he walked the police through every single attack, both fatal and not. It was almost as if he took pride in his efforts, only displaying any sort of regret over the death of Dane MacDonald. He even went so far as to claim that it was God himself who told him to kill. Oh great, somebody else hiding behind the holy. We don't know that song and dance before. Sometimes crazy is just crazy. 
Sutcliffe never held back his hatred for describing the women he attacked. Quote, the women I killed were filth. Bastard sex workers who were littering the streets. I was just cleaning up the place a bit. And uh, we're using sex worker instead of the word that he used there because, uh, yeah. After the confession was put to paper and signed, the police held a press conference. George Oldfield and the other heads of the investigation were all there, and they told the press that the search for the Yorkshire Ripper was over, and that they were absolutely delighted when they very much shouldn't have been. And now I'll happily reign on their parade. Peter Sutcliffe was not caught because of George Oldfield, nor from anyone on the task force. Peter Sutcliffe was caught because of dumb luck, pure and simple. There was no good police work, there was no successful manhunt, and he was found by a stroke of pure chance. I do like the guy who went and looked for the hammer, though, to lock it down. That was good. In my opinion, Oldfield and the police were a complete and utter joke for a full five years, with every last death on their streets on their shoulders. Well, they're on the shoulders of Peter f***ing Sutcliffe, but also the police should have done a better job. The railroading in this case is embarrassing. They let their misogyny and prejudice guide their judgment, clinging to the idea of Sutcliffe purely being a killer of sex workers, even when it was disproven over and over again. They were so desperate to have any sort of clue or lead, and as soon as they received the fake tape and heard the subject had a Geordie accent, that was all they needed, and damn anybody who said different. I'm truly sorry, I can't be nice about this. To call them incompetent would be a kindness. They're an embarrassment. End of story. And once more, just to say this is all my opinion, though I'm sure we aren't too far off from being on the same page here. No, Matt, you and I, on the same page. All our opinion, of course. So, throw the book at him, yes? Well, Sutcliffe was charged the very next day on 13 counts of murder and 7 counts of attempted murder and was brought before the court. Now, this is where it gets interesting. While he pleaded guilty to the attempted murder charges, he also pled not guilty to all counts of murder and then proceeded to throw the whole process for a loop when he pled guilty to manslaughter instead on the basis of diminished responsibility at the behest of his lawyer James Chadwin. Now, I don't feel all that qualified to explain the legalese that is diminished responsibility, it's a little bit complicated, so here's a cameo from everyone's favorite lawyer Liam to explain the insanity with Liam's Legal Corner. Let's go! Hello, folks! My name is Liam, and when I'm not writing cameos in the other writer's scripts, I'm also a writer for Simon who just happens to be a lawyer in England and Wales with former trial experience. Now, that, yeah, Liam normally writes also for this show and is an actual legitimate lawyer. So let's see what he says. Now, that trial experience has taught me that England and Wales is the land of silly, stupid, bullshit laws, and today we're looking at, be, at one of the bullshittiest diminished responsibility. So, take a seat, grab a brew, get ready to answer some questions, and now... Let's take a look at diminished responsibility, what it means, why it sucks, and why I believe this case became a major miscarriage of justice because of it. Something which from prior discussions I know Matt disagrees with me on, so let's turn it into a debate. Okay, let's go. So to start off, diminished responsibility is a defense to murder. I believe it's it can it's only a defense to murder, right, Liam? which may be raised by a defendant where that defendant is suffering from a medically recognized condition at the time of the crime which affected the mental functioning to the extent that they cannot rightfully be held responsible. All right, so if someone's like mad at the time of murdering someone because of a medically recognized disease, they could be like, it was my disease that made me do it. So, what's the issue here? Well, insanity is a defense to any crime which may be raised by a defendant where that defendant was suffering from a medically recognized condition at the time of the crime which affected their mental functioning to the extent that they rightfully may be held responsible. So what's the difference? Okay, so what's the difference between the two? Okay, I'm half remembering some shit right now. But isn't it that one, if you're insane, then you can be sectioned and sent away forever? Like, that's why lawyers often don't want to go for insanity in the UK, because it's like, well, you don't know how long you're going to go away for. They might just be like, you need to spend the rest of your life in a mental institution, and you might never be able to leave. Whereas at least if you go to prison, they have to, like, define a term. And in this case, I think diminished responsibility is not insanity. So you can plead diminished responsibility and get off. Rather with insanity, you plead insanity and then you go away to a mental institution. At least I think... That's what it is. I'm sure Liam's about to tell us. I'm just trying to guess. Well, I, a very experienced criminal liar, not only cannot think of a single practical difference, but there is no literature setting out an actual practical difference. Okay, <laughs> there's no difference. My guess was wrong. Their wording is slightly different, but in practice, each defense applies when we have a mentally ill defendant accused of crimes that is attempting to avoid liability for said crimes. Well, okay, Liam, but why is that an issue, you might ask? Well, not only are both defenses almost identical in meaning, but they have two completely different outcomes. Ah, okay. 
You see, in insanity cases, it is not abnormal for a defendant to be found insane and completely acquitted, sent to a secure psychiatric institution for treatment, but found not criminally guilty. To the contrary, a plea of diminished responsibility finds you guilty of manslaughter, a crime whose maximum sentence is life imprisonment. So, we have two very different outcomes for two very similar defenses. So, on that, I want to ask you, is it fair that a person who committed a crime only because they were suffering from a serious mental illness might still go to prison for said crime? If you said yes, for instance, due to the severity of the crime, then I want to ask you, what benefit do we actually gain? The base claim of imprisonment is that we lock people away as they might offend again. But surely, if somebody only offended because they are ill, that the way to make them less likely to offend again is via treatment, not locking them away in a small cell. Yeah, fair, fair argument. For example, let's say we've got a man called Daniel. Daniel is a paranoid schizophrenic with delusions of religious grandeur. He believes that God speaks to him and has commanded him to murder people. He's clearly seriously unwell and clearly only committed crimes because of his illness. What utility is served by sending him to jail for the rest of his life? Yeah, that's a fair argument because I don't think Daniel deserves to go to prison. He's clearly a, he's parano he's got paranoid schizophrenia. He needs to be treated for that. Well, what would you say? If at trial, despite every medical expert agreeing that Daniel was not only suffering from those very serious medical conditions, but only committed his crimes because of those commissions, but the judge refused to allow the defense of insanity, demanded the defense of re diminished responsibility, and was demanded the defense of diminished responsibility was advanced instead, and even made several inappropriate comments to the jury, telling them not to believe Daniel as he was a liar. Well, I'd be really upset. That doesn't seem fair at all. Well, that's actually what happened in the Yorkshire Ripper case. Sutcliffe said from the earliest police interviews that God had told him to kill the people he did. At trial, both the prosecution and defense experts agreed that he was certainly schizophrenic, and that certainly caused the crimes. Despite that, the judge refused to grant the defense of insanity and said, despite the expert evidence, that the jury would still be entitled to reject the view of the experts and instead take the view of the police that Sutcliffe was a liar. Oh, God, this is complicated. That's such a good defense. I mean, it's a good defense if it's actually true, because surely the medical experts will be able to tell whether you've got this disease or not. Or you could just be really good at faking it. Wow. Unsurprisingly, especially considering what we know from research that juries have a strong bias towards believing the police and a strong skepticism of mental health defenses, and I mean, yeah, fair enough. The jury promptly ignored the claim of diminished responsibility and found Sutcliffe guilty of murder. And so that brings an end to our brief lecture on the diminished responsibility, and I have three questions for you all. Firstly, what do you think of this Diet Coke insanity plea that has basically no practical difference other than a massively increased sentence? Secondly, what do you think of the fact that the judge threw out the insanity plea against the advice of every single expert psychiatrist approached by either side? And finally, do you think Sutcliffe was lying? Many criminologists who have looked at this case have argued that he may have been lying. But the evidence is the evidence, and in my view at least, the evidence says that he was clearly insane. If psychiatrists for the defense and the prosecution are saying that he's insane, then isn't he insane? It's not about lying. I mean, it is about lying, but aren't these experts going to know? Like, surely there's tells and ways to know whether someone is faking uh, insanity. The trial and final years. Ah, thank you, Liam, and now back to our regularly scheduled programming. The trial lasted for two weeks, and the jury was made privy to all the grisly and bloody details of every single murder and assault perpetuated by Sutcliffe, and no voice from God could descend to save him. The defense tried their best to paint him as a lunatic, and as Liam said, they even had experts claiming that he had paranoid schizophrenia, but the jury wasn't buying it. Might have something to do with the testimony of a prison officer claiming he heard Sutcliffe speaking with his wife, saying he overheard them planning to appear insane so that they'd only get ten years in the psych ward. Oops, said AZ. When it was all said and done, Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, was found guilty on all counts. I think I would, if I was on the jury, right, I would make my decision based on what I see in court of him. There's not enough information here for me to say, yeah, he was insane or he wasn't insane. I'd need to see how he is. I'd need to hear all the arguments from the psychiatrists and the defense. And I'd need to look at this cop in the eye as he tells me that he heard him talking to his wife about his plan to plea insanity and stuff like that. I'd need to get a vibe from him. <laughs> I don't know it's really weird to say that. I need to get a vibe on whether this guy's guilty, but kind of that's the point, isn't it? That's what juries do. They listen to both sides and they get a vibe. <laughs> My vibe is I'd send him to prison. <laughs> With there being no death penalty in the UK, no matter how much the public wanted to see him hang, there was only one sentence that seemed appropriate. Sutcliffe was sentenced to 20 concurrent sentences of life imprisonment, with Justice Boreham stating that Sutcliffe was beyond redemption, and he hoped that he would never be released. 
With this, and with how the British system, legal system works, Sutcliffe was made to serve a minimum of 30 years before the opportunity for parole. Like you would ever get it. Apparently, the High Court of Justice thought the same thing, as on July the 16th, 2010, Sutcliffe was resentenced, this time to a whole life tariff, meaning that any and all hope of ever getting out, no matter how minuscule it might have been, crashed and burned before his very eyes. To say Sutcliffe's stay in prison was eventful would be an understatement. At first, he was placed in H.M. Prison Parkhurst on May 22, 1981, but eventually was sent to Broadmoor Hospital in March 1984. His wife obtained a separation around 1989 and a divorce in 1994. His father died in 2004, and he was allowed to visit Arnside, where the ashes had been scattered in 2005. He was attacked a total of four times while imprisoned. That's not bad. Only four times over however long he's been in there. Decades. Especially for someone who murdered a kid. Or like a 14 year 14 year old 16 year old the first was in parkhurst on january the 10th 1983 by career criminal james costello after he followed sutcliffe into the hospital wing at parkhurst and plunged a broken coffee jar twice into the left side of sutcliffe's face which required 30 stitches the second attack was by convicted robber paul wilson on february the 23rd 1996 where sutcliffe was nearly strangled with the cable from a pair of stereo headphones a year later, on March 10, 1997, fellow inmate Ian Kay attacked him with a pen, causing him to lose vision in his left eye and leaving his right eye terribly damaged. The fourth attack was by Jesus Christ, he was blinded with a pen. That is... Whoa. The fourth attack was by fellow inmate Patrick Sarida on December 22, 2007, who lunged at him with a metal cutlery knife and stabbed him in the cheek after missing his right eye, all the while screaming, You f***ing raping murdering bastard. I'll blind your f***ing other one. Wow, these guys really want to blind him for some reason. All the while, he was suffering from diabetes, having been diagnosed with the disease in 2003. And say it with me, everyone. Oh, no! <laughs> and that brings us to 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. By this time, Sutcliffe had a number of underlying health issues, including diabetes and obesity. He had been receiving... How do you get obese in prison? Aren't they, like, feeding you, like, the minimum calories? That you need and he had been receiving treatment for two weeks after a suspected heart attack and after all of that he'd still refused any sort of treatment or vaccine for the virus well look no one ever said he was smart soon enough he fell ill and was transported to the university hospital of north durham but there was really no saving him not that anyone really wanted to in the first place peter sutcliffe the yorkshire ripper died of complications of coronavirus on november the 13th 2020 age 74. I mean, not that anyone, to say like no one wanted to save him, it's like when he was sent to hospital and the doctors are going to do their job. They're going to be like, is this guy the Yorkshire Ripper? Well, okay, let's fix him up and send him back to prison. They're going to try. They're doctors. It's what they do. Honestly, I never thought I'd say this, but thanks, COVID. And that is the end of the story today. No, this is a difficult one, folks. I'm not going to lie. The fact that this is also my longest script for the show today doesn't really help matters. The story of the Yorkshire Ripper is one weighed down by the sheer uselessness of the police and uplifted by the outcry for change and justice from the women of West Yorkshire. The nights were haunted by the shadow of Peter Sutcliffe, and the darkness seemed to shield him at every single turn, slipping through the police's grasp at any and all occasions where he was in their sights. It clouded the eyes and minds of the authorities, and because of that, so many women were put in their graves. The police failed the win of West Yorkshire, it's as simple as that. And they had no right to celebrate, as they did, when things were finally resolved. Yeah, agreed. Now, I know what you must be thinking, but Matt, what about Weirside Jack? Oh, <laughs> no, I wasn't thinking about that. Just let that story drop. The guy who sent the tape. Did they get him? What are the man behind the letters and the tape? Well, let's clear that up right now, as thankfully he didn't escape justice. Oh my god, I hope you go to prison. I really hope you get some serious prison time for this. Like, five years to ten years. Because you really up. In 2005, the case was reopened and looked over with fresh DNA evidence. DNA from the envelopes the letters were sealed. It was pointed the back finger at one man, John Humble, the resident of Sunderland and an alcoholic nobody. He was arrested in October 2005, and while interrogated, he stated he felt nothing but shame for what he'd done, calling it evil and saying that he deserved to be in prison. He hated the police. He wanted to be famous, and he had been obsessed with Jack the Ripper, so much so that he'd made the express decision to create the tape and the letters and fundamentally ruined the investigation. Tried at Leeds Crown court on January the 6th, Humble initially pled not guilty. He eventually admitted to being Wearside Jack and changed his plea to guilty on all counts. He was sentenced to eight years in prison on March the 21st, 2006. Those released in 2009, only serving half of his sentence. He lived until July the 30th, 2009, when he died of heart failures, heart failure and the effects of his alcoholism in his home in South Shields. Thanks for nothing, dumbass. Yeah, <laughs> don't do this. And it's also like fucking DNA. I love that someone went and found that envelope and like ran it for DNA years later, decades later. And they were like, hello. 
<laughs> remember that tape you sent that really fucked with us guess who's going to prison now bitch at the end of the day peter sutcliffe may he forever burn was an evil and depraved man one who was ruined by his upbringing and compounded by the impotence and inadequacy he was made to feel at home is that any excuse no of course not and because of his boundless rage and hatred he went out on the streets hunting stalking and in the end so many women all innocent ended up dead with that I plead with you all, dear audience, to think of and remember the victims, both alive and deceased. Peter Sutcliffe is the name remembered these days, but that's not right. They were people too, and it's their names that deserve to be lifted up, not his. The dead. Wilma McCann, Emily Jackson, Irene Richardson, Patricia, Tina, Atkinson, Mitra, Jane MacDonald, Jean Dorden, Yvonne Pearson, Eleanor, Helen, Ritka, Vera Millwood, Josephine Whitaker, Barbara Babs Leach, Marguerite Walls, Jacqueline Hill. The survivors, the first unnamed sex worker, Anna Rogolsky, Olive Smelt, Tracy Brown, Marcella Claxton, Maureen Long, Marilyn Moore, Maureen Mo Lee, Upadia Bandara, Teresa Sykes, Olivia Rivers. Dismembered appendices. Number one. There hasn't been much of note that I haven't covered about Sutcliffe in the script, so here I actually put the points I had originally put for Jack, which unfortunately didn't make it in time for the official video. Number two, or I suppose number one really. Jack the Ripper has been featured in several movies up to this point. From Hell is a film based on the graphic novel of the same name and stars Ian Holm as Sir William Gull as Jack the Ripper and he goes up against Johnny Depp playing investigator Frederick Abilene. Jack has even gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the great Sherlock Holmes in two separate films, A Study in Terror and Murder by Decree, released in 1965 and 1970 respectively. 3. Jack has also been present in many video games. The character of Raiden in the Metal Gear franchise is sometimes given the nickname Jack the Ripper. Sherlock Holmes vs. Jack the Ripper was released in 2009 and once more pits the greatest detection in fiction against the killer, and the Ripper appears as a former assassin and villain in a DLC for Assassin's Creed The Syndicate. Never played any of these games. Number 4. The Ripper has also seemed to influence creators in The Land of the Rising Sun. He, or in this case she, has appeared as a summoned servant in the manga and anime Fate of Apocrypha, and again as a female in the manga and anime Black Butler. He has a very minor role in the Phantom Blood arc of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, and more recently has appeared as a heroic spirit fighting for the sake of humanity in Record of Ragnarok. I feel like in Japan they've misunderstood who Jack the Ripper is. They're just like, it's a good name. <laughs> He's like some sort of spirit hero. What the fuck? Number 5. Many other killers have been given the title of Ripper throughout the years, all in homage to Jack, and a couple have been covered on this channel. Bible John, also known as Scotland's Jack the Ripper. Andre Chikatilo was given the name of the Rostov Ripper, and one of the nicknames of Tamara Samsonova was the Granny Ripper. Lastly, an unidentified serial killer was named the Atlanta Ripper as they went on a killing spree in 1911 and 1912, claiming the lives of at least 15 African American women. It makes you wonder who will be branded with the moniker of the Ripper next. Let's hope we never have to find out. Oh, but we will. Of course we will, because there's plenty of psychos out there. Number 6. Lastly, I can say that my writing about true crime, especially Jack the Ripper and Peter Sutcliffe, has inspired me in my own personal writing, as well as other activities. I've made plans to write a fictional crime thriller novel at some point in my future, and these scripts have been good practice along with the research. Jack has also influenced a villainous character within my own D&D &D campaign I run for my friends, and I plan on using said character in a future sequel to the book that I have out right now. Oh, shit. Matt sent me his book! I didn't forget, Matt! Here it is, look! He sent it to me! That said, Devil's Bane and the Curse of, the, of Decay is my first book and it's been out for over a year now. It's available on Amazon, Audible, and Kindle. It's a fun mix of fantasy, action, and horror. It ain't no Lord of the Rings, but I'm mighty proud of it. I hope it for it to become a series. And for those interested, I hope you do too. Check it out, look! That's cool, it's called The Devil's Bane and the Curse of Decay. It's available. Go search it on Amazon, wherever you get your books. No, just on Amazon. Amazon, Audible, and Kindle. Thank you, Matt, for writing today's episode. I've been your host, Simon, and I'll see you next time.